Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the five precepts and the three refuges that uh, an official Buddhist takes. Um, it is a way of committing yourself to a path. A path that leads to wisdom, clarity, and peace. It's a, it's a conscious choice. It's something that needs to be done because you want to, not because you have to or should. And when you take the refuge and the five precepts, you're given a Buddhist name. And the reason you're given a Buddhist name is because it helps motivate and accelerate your personal growth as a Buddhist. Now, in the secular world, you're also given other names as well. For instance, a woman may start out as Miss and evolve into Mrs. and then go into Mom and then go into Grandma. And each level requires you to be a little bit different and to be a little more skillful. And that's what giving a Buddhist name requires. It requires you to reflect on what the name is and how you can use it to re-identify yourself um, first as human and then as Buddhist. You're always going to be human first and Buddhist second until you achieve nirvana. Then you'll be Buddhist first and human second. So if you find it difficult to hold the precepts, human first, Buddhist second. But the idea is to try and hold them as best you can. Refuge. I take refuge in the Buddha. A historical person who lived 2,600 years ago, who became perfect through his own wisdom and compassion. He didn't have a teacher. He rediscovered the path to nirvana. You don't have to do that. His path is available to us today. So it's a little easier, but it's time consuming. Sometimes a couple lifetimes, sometimes many lifetimes. But we look at him as an ideal, not as a god, but as, as a human that achieved his full perfection, his full potential, total realization before he died. Taking refuge in the Dharma. The Dharma has 16 different meanings, but in this case it means the teachings of the Buddha and truth. So when you hear the teachings of the Buddha, what you're hearing is a particular kind of truth. And it may not seem or be true to you when you first hear it, so the Buddha encourages you to go out and test it. See if it's as true to you as it was to me, he might have said. And that's our job, not to take it on faith, but to test it, prove it to be true, and then our insecurities about the truth turn into confidence about the path. Number three, I take refuge in the monks and nuns. I take refuge in the Sangha. In a traditional way, Sangha means monks and nuns, uh, those who are ordained uh, as novice monks or fully ordained. Not in lay people, but in America, Sangha can be used loosely to include people who are on the Buddhist path. But in this case, I take refuge in the Sangha, I take refuge in the monks and nuns as an example, a living example of the Dharma, of the teachings of the Buddha. And, and the idea is, is to use them as a reference point and I've always felt that we're using monks and nuns as our partners on the path. They may have been doing it longer or shorter than we have been practicing, but I like to think of them side by side, not way in front and we're trying to catch up, but side by side, friends on the path, the Sangha. And they are there to answer questions and give support. They could also be considered cheerleaders as you walk the path to your nirvana. So taking refuge in the Buddha, taking refuge in the Dharma, taking refuge in the Sangha.
Now we have the five precepts that every Buddhist takes. These are moral precepts. These are designed to change the way you speak and the way you act. In number one, I will practice not taking life. When we accept the training precept of not taking life, it really is a training precept. I'm going to train myself not to take life. I'm going to train myself not to kill that cockroach in the kitchen, but catch it and let it go for another day. I'm going to train myself not to kill the mosquito. I'm going to try to catch it and let it go and honor its life. But in following those precepts, what we find is that sometimes we break them. The mosquito started to attack at three, and by four you were ready to kill that, <laughs> to kill that little guy and wish him a good rebirth. <laughs> you know. So it's not going to be perfect. We're going to have times when we're challenged. But what the precepts allow us to do is think about not killing. Think about how important life is and how rare it is to be born on this planet, one of the only planets, if not the only planet, that can support life. It's a miracle. And everybody, everything, every little creature made it for whatever reason. And now it's here for a very short time, never to come back again. Buddhists are the only ones that get to come back again. <laughs> Which may or may not be a good thing. So it's time to reflect. Now, say you like to go fishing. Now, fishing is a euphemism for killing fish. <laughs> and, and, and so a lot of people just feel the day isn't a day until you have a couple beers and kill a couple fish. And then they say, look at the day I've had today. We don't want to impose our new morality on them. But we could maybe have a Coca-Cola and go along for a boat ride. <laughs> You know, as, as a way of practicing, do we have to kill the fish to have a good day? Can we, can we not kill the fish and have a good day? Or are we going to eat the fish? Or can somebody else kill the fish and then we eat the fish? There's all sorts of levels of this, and this idea of not killing allows us to ruminate or think or reflect on, on life and death. Number two, I will practice not taking what is not given. This is very difficult, because oftentimes we think we have permission, and maybe we don't. Maybe we're at Denny's, and we see the ketchup on the table. Do we have permission to use that ketchup? Or do we have to ask? So a Buddhist would say, well, I took the precept not to take what is not given. I wasn't given the authority to use the ketchup. Maybe I should ask the waitress if it's okay. Now this would be a Buddhist practice. It wouldn't be necessary, but you might want to see what happens when you ask the waitress, is it okay to use the ketchup? <laughs> Just to get her opinion. We're also stuck because we've become consumers of America and have many receipts that show ownership was transferred to us. So we own like a lot of stuff, but it's an illusion. We don't own anything. We're just using stuff until somebody wants it more than we do. We can't find it the new model comes out, or it's broken. People think they own the stuff because they have a, uh, a receipt, so if we take what they think they own, when in actuality they're just using it, we're increasing their suffering, not decreasing their suffering. In a Buddhist, the idea of a moral value is to use a reference point that allows you to reduce suffering, not increase suffering. And it's even worse even more important, if you're at a monastic retreat. A few years ago, we had a monastic retreat at Shasta Abbey. And we had some forest monks of the Achan Cha forest tradition, who are very particular about their precepts and following them. We were offered a nice apple for dessert. And one of the monks put the apple next to his plate. But a layperson noticed the apple and picked it up and said, this is really a nice apple. You're very lucky to be able to eat it. Now, because the layperson touched the apple, the monk couldn't eat it because ownership had been transferred by the touch. But another layperson noticed the dilemma the monk was facing and offered, re-offered the apple again to the monk. Now, the moral of this story is don't touch monk's food.
<laughs> Number three, no sexual misconduct. This is a fairly easy one for a Buddhist and very complicated for everybody else. So let me tell you what Bhikkhu Bodhi said in his booklet called The Noble Eightfold Path. He said there are four things the Buddhist needs to uh, shy away from, not indulge in when it comes to sexuality. Number one, do not have sex with people that are married. Number two, do not have sex with people who are engaged. Number three, do not have sex with children. Number four, do not have sex with people against their will. Those are the four things. And three of those have to do with family. And if you remember, before the Buddha was the Buddha, he was Siddhartha, and he was married, and he had a child. And he realized the family unit became the building blocks of every community. It needed to be honored and respected. So in our sexuality, we need to find a way to avoid those four negative aspects of sexual activity. And, and, and uh, I'm fairly certain everybody can have a wonderful sex life by avoiding those and just doing everything else. <laughs> Number four, do not speak unskillfully. Four kinds of speech that we want to avoid. False speech, harsh speech, malicious speech, gossip, and idle chatter. Those four kinds of speech increase suffering rather than decrease suffering. So if you tune in to TMZ, the TV show, you may be breaking those precepts. I'm not sure. Number five, the most difficult precept of all. And, and this requires great mindfulness. Number five, I will practice not to consume intoxicants. I will practice not to get high. Now, one of my favorite blues songs by Albert Collins, the master of the Telecaster, goes, I ain't drunk, I just been drinking. <laughs> and one of the things now we need to weigh is, is it okay to drink in a social way and not get drunk? Is it still consuming intoxicants? Is it okay to take pills that the doctor has prescribed to you? Would that be taking intoxicants? Do you know? And, and so you need to work it out. Some Buddhists go so far as to say no chocolate, no cake, no Coca-Cola, because all those can be addictive and change your conscious mental state. So it's up to you. And I, Reverend Karuna used to say, if you're used to drinking a case of beer a week, when you take your precepts, maybe you go down to two six-packs. <laughs> <laughs> and then as time goes on, one six-pack. And then as time goes on, a couple beers. And then as time goes on, you may feel that drinking or consuming intoxicants, whether they be drugs or alcohol, really sort of works against you. Because as a Buddhist, we spend a lot of time on the cushion meditating cultivating our mind, trying to achieve clarity. And, and intoxicants will cloud that clarity in a moment. And you might end up doing something so stupid that you break the other four precepts and not even know you did. So the five precepts are designed to change your karma, your speech karma and your action karma. Meditation is designed to change your mind karma. The three refuges are a place, literally, to seek refuge when things aren't going as well as they could be. This is, this is where you start reflecting now on how important a refuge can be, because this world is a crazy place, and sometimes we just need to pull back, take refuge, and refocus our energies on what's important in our life. So much congratulations to the people today who are going to take the precepts and identify themselves as a Buddhist. And um, I would have to say, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend Kosala.